Welcome everyone. I am back with the last chapter in how to handle your emotions. This chapter is called self-worth. Discovering your God-given worth. What happens when you long to receive a gift, but only your sister is given a gift? What happens when you long to be held on your mother's lap, but only your sister is allowed on her lap? What happens when you long for your mother's love, but your sister is the only one given her love? Ask Dory Van Stone. Dory will tell you that repeated rejection is the bleeding ground for low self-worth. Her own mother never even wanted her. Her mother always called her ugly. Dory never reached, never received the love and affection her heart so deeply craved. However, what a comfort for Dory and for all the Dorys in the world, both male and female, to come to know this truth from God's word. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 7. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Why should Dory feel any sense of worth even before she and her sister were discarded at an orphanage? Life with their mother was filled with rejection. Her mother would leave Dory in charge of her little sister Maria for hours. A six-year-old girl responsible for the total care of a five-year-old. Each time this happened, Dory longed desperately for her mother to return, saying to herself, I hope she'll be glad to see me. But each time her mother returned, she brushed right past Dory to gather Marie in her arms, giving her, giving her great big hug and sometimes bringing a gift. Always showering attention on Marie and never on Dory, no matter, no no wonder Dory was left reeling with low self-worth. As the psalmist said, scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. Psalm 69 verse 20. What is self-worth? As a child, Dory didn't have a concept of self-worth. How could she? As a continually rejected child, how could she feel any sense of significance, of value, of worth? Even more basic than that, how do you determine the worth of something or someone? How do you know your own worth? Do you look, do you look to yourself or others in order to grasp your value? If you look anywhere other than to God, the God who created you with a purpose and a plan, your view of your value is in grave danger of being distorted. Before you were born, God established your true worth by creating you, by choosing you, and ultimately by dying for you. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Worth signifies the value, merit, or significance of a person or thing. Self-worth is the belief that your life has value and significance. Worth in the biblical Greek text, axios, which means of which means of weight and worth in biblical times gold and other precious metals were placed on a balance on a balancing balancing scale upon which their worth was determined by their weight leading to expression worth their weight in gold limitations chapter uh, 4 verse 2 
How can anyone's worth be determined? Question. At an auction, the worth of an item is determined clearly and simply by one thing, the highest price paid. Each item goes to the highest bidder. You were bought from the auction block of sin over 2,000 years ago. When the Heavenly Father paid the highest price possible for you, the life of his son. By that one act, your worth was forever established by God. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price for you, willingly dying on the cross to pay to pay the penalty for your sins. He loves you that much. Your true worth is based not on anything you have done or will do, but on what Jesus has already done. Without a doubt, he established your worth, but you were worth his life. You were worth dying for it. John chapter 15, uh, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. What is self-esteem? In Dory's younger years, no one person valued her. No one found pleasure in her. And because no one esteemed her, she had no sense of self-esteem. She could easily see which of, which of the other children around her were treated with value and as a result felt valuable. Her sister was one of the highly favored ones. What makes you feel good about yourself? Do you consider your opinions worthy of consideration by others? Do you expect others to respect your boundaries or do you hold yourself in such low esteem that you do not establish and maintain healthy boundaries? Boundaries that line up with God's purpose for your life. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 3, By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. To esteem means to set a high value on. To esteem in biblical Hebrew is nabat, which means to esteem to look with favor or regard with pleasure. To have self-esteem is to respect or to have high regard for yourself. Proverbs 22 verse one says, a good name is, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Question. Why do some people prefer not to focus on self-esteem, but only self-worth? Answer. The phrase self-esteem actually has two different meanings that are opposite to each other. The first kind of self-esteem is an objective regard of your value, which the Bible refers to as humility. This self-worth is rooted in recognition of your sin and your need for the Savior. It recognizes your need to live independently on him and affirms the fact that Christ established your worth by dying for you. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, This is the one I esteem, he who was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The second kind of self-esteem is an exaggerated regard of your value, which the Bible refers to as pride. This self-esteem is rooted in the idea that you are good enough within yourself to meet your own needs and therefore you do not, you do not need to live dependently on the Savior. Your worth is, your worth is established by your inherent goodness and personal accomplishments. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. In the Bible, God places two types of esteem. 
two types of self-esteem in sharp contrast to one another. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. First Peter chapter five, verse five. What is an inferiority complex? How could Dory not feel inferior when for years she was continuously treated as inferior? Emblazoned in her memory are scenes of her mother tucking her sister, tucking her sister into bed saying, Marie is a pretty girl. She, she's not like you. Then after tenderly kissing Marie, her mother would callously walk past Dory. Repeated instances of rejection are the building blocks of an inferiority complex. Constant rejection can cause a person to feel he or she has little worth and, and lead that person to think such thoughts as these. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors. I am a dread to my friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten by them as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. An inferiority complex is a painful, debil debilitating feeling of being less valuable than others. Inferior means less value than others. A complex is a group of beliefs based on the past that has a powerful influence on present behavior. An inferiority complex is an acute sense of low self-worth, which can produce two different results. Fearfully timid, fearfully timid attitudes and actions that cause the person to easily cave in to others or feel or feel rejected by others. I am nothing. I know I don't I know I don't matter. Overly aggressive attitudes and actions expressed in an attempt to compensate for feeling rejected. Since people hate me, I'll give them something to hate. When Dory was placed in an orphanage, she became the bitter bully who punched and pinched the other children just to make them cry. Openly hostile, Dory used fear tactics, fear tactics to get her way and get her way she did. The Psalm describes what she was like. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Psalm chapter uh, 73 verses 21 through 22. Mephibosh Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth felt like the weakest link in the royal chain. Crippled in both feet at a young age, he never felt able to live up to the accomplishments of his family. His grandfather, King Saul was a fierce warrior. His father, Jonathan, was an accomplished soldier. But he was unable to stand on his own two feet, let alone to do battle. Following the deaths of both Saul and Jonathan, when David claimed the throne, <clears throat> Mephibosheth sank into financial and emotional quicksand. He lived in the land of Lodabar, which means the house of no bread. Though his family had ruled the nation and enjoyed substantial wealth, he ended up with nothing. He went from the palace to poverty because he could not even afford his own lodging. He lived in another man's home. King David summoned, summoned him to appear before his throne. Mephibosheth was afraid, not only because his life offered no value to David, but also because the custom of the day was for kings to execute those who might pose a threat for the throne. 
He felt helpless and hopeless. He shuffled on his lame feet, crawling into the new king's house to answer David's summons. He threw himself on the ground before David and declared himself to be nothing more than a dead dog. David's response shocked the young cripple who had known little kindness in his life. Do not be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, and you will always eat at my table. Imagine his astonishment. David, the powerful warrior, king demonstrated compassion to a cripple. But why? Why would he show kindness to a weak invalid who was, in his own words, a dead dog who could offer no service to the king, who was a reminder of his grandfather's murderous vengeance, all directed toward the newly crowned king? Because long before David had entered into a covenant relationship with his dear friend Jonathan, a covenant vow of loyalty that extended to the family of Jonathan. And as David promised, he ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Picture David's sons and daughters gathering for an evening meal, the aristocratic, the selfish, the proud, handsome, the beautiful, the scholarly, the quiet, then shuffling along behind, taking his place among the king's sons and daughters. At the finest table in the land is this dead dog, He may have once felt worthless and utterly without value, but because of the king's grace, he is now a part of the family and he discovers he has infinite worth. If you suffer from feelings of inferiority or feeling like an emotional cripple, know that the king of kings in his grace has reached out to you with care and compassion to adopt you into his family and take you as his own. The Bible says, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with pleasure and will. As a member of the family of Christ, you have a place reserved at the king's table forever. Make no mistake, you are no mistake. Make no mistake, you are no mistake. Not only are you wanted, but you also have immeasurable worth. What is the self-love controversy? Given her mother's rejection, Dory struggled over a lack of self-worth. Some people would say she should not have any sense of self-worth because that's prideful. Others would say she should have self-worth, self-worth because it's healthy, which is right, especially from a Christian standpoint. Is there a place in life of a Christian for self-respect, self-worth, and self-love or does the Bible exhort us to disrespect, devalue, and even hate ourselves? The Bible appears to support both self-love and self-hate, a seeming contradiction that has resulted in some very real controversy. Because the Bible cannot contradict itself, we need discernment to know how to think accurately about ourselves. Proverbs chapter 16 
uh, verse 21 says, the wise in heart are called discerning and pleasant words promote instruction. The, the three views, I should not love myself. It's wrong for me to love my own life. Instead, I should hate myself. The Bible supports from John chapter 12, verse 25, the man who loves his life will lose it. While man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal. Also from Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I should love myself. God tells me in his word that it is appropriate for me to love myself. The Bible supports from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. This commandment is found twice in Leviticus and then repeated in six other books of the Bible, a total of 10 times. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse, verse 18 and 34, Matthew chapter 19, verse 19, including chapter 22, verse 39, Mark chapter 12, verse 31, including chapter 12, verse 33, Luke chapter 10, verse 27, Romans chapter 13, verse 9, Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, James chapter 2, verse 8. But I don't know, I don't know whether I should love myself, but I do know I should love others. I am unsure of what scripture says about self-love, but I know I should have sacrificial love for others. The Bible supports from from 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Two major questions. Question one. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, does Jesus really mean for me to hate my family and myself? To interpret any literary work correctly, a major element of interpretation must be considered. Context. That is, we need to look at how hatred is used in, in context of the whole counsel of God's word. Moses wrote, do not hate your brother in your heart. The Ten Commandments state, honor your father, honor the Ten Commandments state, honor your father and your mother. It does not say you are to hate your father and mother. The Apostle John said, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Astonishing his hearers, Jesus said, you have heard that is was said. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Conclusion one, based on the whole counsel of God, we are not to carry hatred in our hearts. When Jesus spoke of hating our father, mother, sister, brother, and even our own lives, he was not promoting a lifestyle of personal hatred. Such a message is completely inconsistent with the heart of the Bible and the heart of the Lord. Jesus instead appealed to his followers to hate anything that stood in the way of their giving, their relationship, to hate anything that stood in the way of their giving, their relationship with him. Jesus instead appealed to his followers to hate anything that stood in the way of their giving. 
their relationship with him absolute priority. Of, of their anything that stood in the way of their giving and their relationship with him, keeping him an absolute priority. If we want to be true disciples, Jesus must be preeminent. He must occupy the place of highest priority in our lives. We should not let anyone or anything take the place that he alone should have. The Apostle Paul builds a case for this in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 through 18. By him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything, he might have the supremacy. Question two. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. But am I really supposed to love myself? Or is that arrogance and pride? I know many people struggle with that. Answer. When we hear the word love, we usually assume it refers to affectionate love or passionate love. But agape is the Greek word used in this passage. And agape refers to a commitment to do what is best on behalf of others. If you truly love your neighbor as yourself, you must comprehend the context of this love as well as understand its roots. Jesus presents the two, the, the two most important commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The Apostle Paul states that love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. We are to live with agape love, which is based not on feeling, but on commitment. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. But love your enemies? do good to them lend to them without expect lend to them without expecting to get anything back then your reward will be great and you will be and you will be sons of the most high because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked we are to love what god loves which means in part that we are to value the truth that god loves us we love because he first loved us. Conclusion two. The Bible says God is love. The essence of God is agape. A love that always seeks the highest and best on behalf of others. If we are truly godly, then we will value what God values and love what he loves. We should love the fact that God has a purpose for us and that he values us and that he has given us worth. You have agape love for yourself when you do what God says is best for you, cooperating with his perfect plan for your life. And you have agape love for those around you when you seek God's very best for them. From Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the 
the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself.